It's my distinct uh, honor and pleasure to welcome all of you here today for the final, final session of the Gold Center University Alive. Um, but it's encore. encore, the encore session. But it's going to be carried on in other forms as the um, professor has, um, there are other organizations that are going to pick up this kind of work. And so um, this won't be the last time I know we will be meeting. There's some of here who we've seen before in Australia and America and we're back again and I'd like to welcome all the ones who've been here before and the new ones. Um, because without your participation, we wouldn't be here. This wouldn't be possible. Um, this is going to be filmed and presented later on DVD, so if anybody has any objections to uh, being filmed for reasons of vanity or previous uh, legal mischievousness, uh, just tell us and uh, we will take note of that. <laughs> and, uh, let's cut you out of this. But anyway, um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Antal Fekete. Um, all of you are familiar with him. I'm sure that's why you've come here. Um, and I just would like to give my own personal thanks to you um, of, of what you've done for, for so many of us, Professor. Um, uh, on the way in, I spoke with uh, Philip Barton, who came here two years ago and is now starting the Gold Standard Institute in Vienna uh, to um, promote the Gold Standard because of the Professor's influence. Um, he's been a lone voice in the darkness. And um, in these times, uh, you cannot underestimate the value of the knowledge that you brought to the table. And I want to thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I welcome you on this swan song session of the Gold Standard University Live. That's the bad news. But the good news is far more important. I'm going to call on Philip in a minute or two to say a few words about the much more important and more uh, and broader based Gold Standard in Institute, which he is forming. Without him, it wouldn't be. And I'm very grateful to him. And I would like to recommend his efforts to your good um, consideration. And uh, he will say a little bit more about it so that you will have an idea. And he will also distribute cards. With the... This first hour of our session, originally I was going to talk about the marginal productivity of debt. But it so happened that we have something which I want you to listen to. Sandy Jetley from London, England. He calls himself a student of mine. However, I'd like to assure you that I'm as much a student of his as he is a student of mine. The uh, thing is that he is our expert on the gold basis, silver basis, and uh, backwardation. Because we promised when we started the Gold Standard Institute, uh, rather Gold Standard University, we promised that we are going to address this very important area which nobody in the whole world is touching or was touching at that time. And I was very fortunate that uh, Sandy was willing to do the research and he's still doing it. So he, I am going to give him the better part of this period that he will talk to you about his research. Now, I call on Philip to say just a few words about what the Gold Standard Institute, Institute is about and what are the immediate plans and uh, I think this is a, just a wonderful development and I'm very very grateful to Philip that he took it upon himself to promote the idea and do the uh, lion's share of the work. Philip, Philip Barton. Thank you very much. 
Um, just before I do that, I'd also like to echo Daryl and validate you for the wonderful work that you've done and are still doing today with Gold Standard University Live. It was, uh, your work was a revelation to me, and I'm sure to many others in the room today, and to also to thousands around the world who would love to be here today but can't be. It's been a really fantastic one-man effort. And, uh, it's created, you know, it's, it was that stone in the pond that rippled outwards to wonderful effect. So Thank you. But, um, and from that, one of those ripples in the pond was that in um, early December, just, a bit, just under four months ago, and I'll keep this very brief, I decided to found the Gold Standard Institute. Um, the purpose, goals, the, the reason for that are um, many, but um, the primary goal is to mm -hmm. establish the full gold standard in one country. It is only necessary in one country because the immediate attraction of capital, expertise and um, skills to that country would be sufficient that other countries would be forced to follow. And uh, if any of you doubt that, you're actually wrong. It will happen. This is not an airy-fairy idea. This is something that is going to happen. We are approaching a historical time Pressure is building, we are, we are reaching a cusp where change will happen. Historically, if you look back, that change can be pretty horrible, you know. Inflation, great inflation has led to Mao Zedong, to Napoleon, to Hitler, it goes on and on and on. We need to be there expounding the virtues of the gold standard at that point so that there is a positive option for people at that time, that there is an alternative. I have already spoken in a very limited way with some people from government, and they are very aware of this situation. They are not averse to gold. Not these people that I spoke to anyway. They were very interested in listening to the, about the gold standard. So that's what we're doing, and it's very real. We actually will achieve this. We actually have to. There isn't an option, because the alternative is actually dreadful, really dreadful. There is a time of change approaching. We need to make sure that it's a time of positive change. So that's what I'm doing. Thank you, Professor. What about Vienna? Well, I, I'm reluctant to say too much about Vienna because I don't have a signed and sealed document. But I had a meeting with officials and officials in Vienna. And um, we have a very strong possibility of 5,000 square foot in the central business district of Vienna in a prestigious building with 10 years rent free if we will establish the Gold Standard Institute in Vienna. Now, we still have some other options to explore, and I do not have a signed document, which makes me a little reluctant to speak about it. As soon as you push me, I will. <laughs> but I don't have a document at this stage. And you know, things can come along, but I have to tell you I'm very confident, and he was very confident that this would happen. He does have to get it signed off elsewhere, but um, that's what we're looking at. And we're looking at this immediately as well. This is not something in the far off distance. We have to get a move on here. Time is of the essence for a number of reasons. And uh, I intend to have the Gold Standard Institute up and running and producing results before the end of this year. I haven't actually told you that either, have I? But I intend for September, October to have the Gold Standard Institute then up. official opening yep. ceremony. Yep. Yeah, which you'll be at and then you'll have to go off to Australia. <laughs> that's first, right, yeah. First seminar. Yeah. So, yeah, that's about Vienna. But I, I have to stress, I do not have a document at this stage. I don't have anything signed. I do not have that lease signed and dated. And I just have um, a commitment from uh, a guy who's a really nice guy. I really liked him. He's very sincere and he's very interested in the story of gold. And we discussed the philosophical and historical backgrounds of it going back you know, over the span of the Habsburg Empire, which I think it would be his span of interest for gold. And um, it was a great meeting. It was a very exciting meeting. So I think we have every reason to be optimistic. And uh, I need your support in this. You know, this is a really, really worthwhile thing to do. As I said to Professor Pacetti, it's, it's like the greatest right idea at the right time in the whole history of the world. You know, we have this, we are at the cusp of an enormous change, an enormous change. And you and I are all here at this point. It's an amazing time in history. And it is actually, we have a responsibility to ensure to the best of our abilities that it is a positive change. Because we all know that how it could turn out. And we actually have the ability and we have the... We all have abilities. We wouldn't actually be here today if we didn't. And we have a huge responsibility along those abilities to affect positive change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you have the opportunity to look at this 
DVD, I'd like to tell you that this was prepared in San Francisco on the historic day, November the 4th, 2008. That was the day when President Obama was elected in the United States by coincidence. This is about the history, the theory and the history of the Great Depression. I gave a talk at the Economic Club of San Francisco on that subject and there was a debate after the presentation and also an interview which is all uh, included on this DVD. This was prepared professionally. We have a number of copies available at the price of $15 each. So if you're interested, please go to my wife, Judith, <coughs> who will uh, be able to give you, uh, as I say, we have a limited number of copies here. So with this, I just say a very few words about what I was planning to present here at this opening session, but because of the pressure of the time and the interest in various subjects, I uh, gave uh, priority to Sandy. But let me just say this, and this is in print, which will be distributed hopefully by the end of this period, if not then uh, later during our session. The marginal productivity of that. This sounds pretty forbidding, but actually it's a very simple idea. Keynesian economists take great comfort from the thought that the ratio of that to GDP, gross uh, domestic product, is relatively low. It's certainly less than 100%. And they say, well, there's lots of room to increase that, total that. But they are looking at the wrong ratio because what they should be looking at is the additional debt to additional GDP. That is to say, the question is, if you increase total debt by one dollar, how much increase in the GDP can you expect? And that is the key ratio, that is the only ratio which matters, because this gives you the quality of that. It will measure the quality of that. For example, way back before 1971, $1 increase in that could give rise to three dollars increase in GDP. This means that it was well worth going into debt because three times as much benefit the national economy could derive from that kind of investment. But then this indicator started falling and by 1971 it went as low as one, which meant that one dollar increase in that gave you only one dollar increase in GDP. So that made it very dubious that it was worth going into that, to that extent. And then it fell below one, which meant that there was just no justification for going into that because you couldn't even recover your original investment in terms of GDP. And this kept falling and by 2006 it went to zero. And this was an extremely critical point which was missed by all the economists in the whole world. And 
I'm calling your attention to this because now we are below zero, which means that the marginal productivity of that is negative. What does that mean? It means that you go into debt by one dollar and you get a negative increase in GDP, which means a contraction in the economy. And if you look at the mad spending orgy in Washington under the new administration of President Obama, then you will realize that they are going absolutely in the wrong direction. They are increasing that which will further contract the economy, further put a squeeze on prices. But I won't continue because it's all written down and we'll distribute copies and I just want to introduce Sandeep. Please welcome our our young research director who who has done a lot of good work and I think he will summarize what he has done and where we are at this moment and what we can expect in in the future and also he will give you a little bit of uh, his theory. He is studying the uh, markets from the point of view of where housing. Now obviously when you buy gold you are warehousing gold. You are not going to consume it. You just take it as uh, take it for for uh, saving it for a better future so to speak. So a warehousing goal and he will explain how the idea of backwardation and the gold basis, especially negative gold or silver basis, plays a role in this. So with this, without any further ado, I let Sandy take over. Thank you. Thanks very much, Professor. I apologize, I've only got 10 copies of the presentation, so I think it will have to be sort of one between one between three, because I don't think anybody on this <laughs> No one on that side has. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure. Is there a... We could make, make further okay. copies. I, it's not really important, as long as, as long as you can hear me, I suppose. <laughs> but, um, no, um, the main, the main, uh, the main, uh, the main point about uh, warehousing is that it might seem like a uh, anachronistic, uh, anachronistic, um, anachronistic point when looking at the market. You know, there is no need to to to, to warehouse anymore. We're we're in we're in fast-moving markets with lots of derivatives and options and God knows what, you know, there's no need to consider what the point of warehousing originally was about. Um, you know, we mustn't forget that in ancient times there was, there was a need to provide a store for goods that might be needed in times of shortage. Um, that need doesn't disappear no matter how evolved a market becomes. Um, and the principle of trading cash current markets and forward markets is no less relevant today than it was 5,000 years ago. So we can garner a lot of things about looking at markets from this ancient perspective, as it were. And we can garner a lot of things about the state of the market itself by what the warehouseman can and more importantly what he can't what he can't do. So we're going to start off just with a very simple example about sort of what the the errors are out there by the sort of by the financial community when looking at the carry and when it comes to warehousing in particular. 
Um, so let's turn to the uh, to the uh, third page, second page. Various forms of forward contract. So I like to give the example here um, of a local market which is uh, next to my house in Kingston-upon-Thames and it's been there since the 10th century, an apple market. And um, Hampton Court Palace, very ancient palace, um, is where the orchards are from where the apples are obtained. And um, the farmers come, as it says here, to the market around mid-May and September with the produce to sell. <laughs> now, there are a few, few things which one often hears um, when talking about a forward market that seem to make sense uh, until you actually sort of delve into it a bit further. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, of the main, one of the main problems that people, that people don't truly grasp the nature of is that they will say that if apples are trading, let's say, at 50, ki 50 pounds per kilogram for spot delivery, as in for purchase right there and now, and apples one year out are trading at 60 pounds per kilogram, there'll be a, a large number of people that will say the market is pricing in a substantial appreciation in the price of apples one year out. Um, it sounds sane, but is, it, it is actually rubbish. You know, it, 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 that, that, that's not true. It, do, it doesn't mean anything about the price of appreciation of apples or the appreciation of the price of apples going forward. Um, so with that in mind, let's go to, um, let's go to a quick example here. So, a futures market, which I've coined a side business, developed after the actual um, establishment of the market proper. And it was more a sort of betting shop rather than a, um, rather than a, uh, a place to offset risk for the farmer. Now, imagine a courtier from the palace expects a very full harvest and the last kilogram of apples sold at the marketplace was for 80 pounds. Um, he expects there to be a particularly full harvest so he expects the price to transact later on at a much, at a much lower price. So this courtier knows more than he should uh, compared to everyone else, makes an offer to sell one kilogram at 50 pounds. So uh, his friend, another courtier, suspects the same thing and decides to sell another kilogram at 55 pounds. So that is just meant to be on that slide there. That's just a, a quick description of that. So. We see that he, the courtier, is inducing uh, a, a, a lower price than the spot price because he thinks that there is going to be a full harvest. But that is not the natural state. That is not the equilibrium state of that market because the, the marketplace the, the, the stall holder will realise that he might be selling his um, apples at far too high a premium and they won't clear. And he will naturally bring down his offer so that the market moves into a more positive carry. And that is what I'm trying to describe here. So. It might make sense to say that, right, apples are going to be, there's going to be a glut of apples on the marketplace, therefore they should trade at a discount 
to the current price. But that will always reverse itself when the true owner of the apples, the true seller of the apples, realises that his inventory might not clear unless the bid is brought down. All I'm trying to say here is that a move, it's the move in the carry that matters. It's not the actual, the position of the carry itself. Um, so, when we come to um, gold and silver, we have to uh, bear in mind a few things. Uh, first of all, gold and silver are not like apples. Um, you can store them indefinitely. And furthermore, uh, they have a property which is unique to them in that their stocks to flow ratio are the highest of any commodity in the world. Now, I'm not going to be talking about that. Rudy really shall be talking about that uh, later on. Um, but the important point to grasp, and I probably haven't made it quite as clear as I should have, is it's the movement in the, in the, in the, pr in, in the difference between the spot and the forward price that matters. It's not the absolute level itself. Um, and changes in the basis are the things that are important not its absolute level. There is nothing that is absolute in this game. It's all relative. Could you say that it's the first derivative? Yes, it's the first derivative of the basis that's important, rather than the basis itself. Um, now, you know, please interject with questions <coughs> at any moment. If I'm not being clear, I know I'm not being clear. <laughs> but um, that's the point that I want to get through at the moment. It's the change in the basis that matters, not, 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 not per se its absolute level. You have uh, briefly defined backwardation and contango? Yes, yes. Uh, contango is when the forward price is trading at a premium to the spot price, and backwardation is the opposite. Now, again, not very many people consider, consider this, but when you're looking at contango and backwardation, there are actually four sets of prices which you must consider because there is a bid and offer on the spot market and a bid and offer on the forward market. Now, if one uh, wanted to carry something for a profit, you would be, let's say one wanted to carry apples for uh, three months. <coughs> if the bid on future apples is higher to a, sufficient de to a sufficient degree than the offer on the spot market, then you can buy at the spot market and sell at the forward market and lock in, lock in the profit. If you can do that, the market is said to be in contango, in my books. The other way around, backwardation, if you intend to make a profit by selling at spot and buying forward because it's trading at a discount, well then you have to look at the bid on spot and the offer on the forward contract. So many, many people, when they're considering the, the basis, just look at the midpoints of the two and say, well, that's the basis, you know. But it's actually missing the whole sort of argument. So I hope that explains it slightly. Uh, yes. Uh, the, the classical definition, I believe, is that uh, you would have, in a non-perishable good, mm -hmm. a uh, bid and ask of the cash price today, and the contango should entail the difference of the storage cost plus the interest of storage of the good. Yes. Yeah. And as soon as there is a variation uh, different from the two, then you have the whole issue of expectations of the market. Right? Yes, yes, absolutely. If there is a, if there is a, a variation from what should be the norm, then that tells you something about the market. 
um, about the state of inventory in the, in the spot market, basically. So, when we come to gold and silver, um, gold and silver are, are so plentiful that they should always be in a contango, no matter what contract you look at. Because for it not to be in contango implies something about the state of the inventory. And we know everything about the state of the inventory of gold and silver, because it should still be there. <laughs> it's, 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 it, it shouldn't have disappeared, because that's what it's implying. <laughs> so, it's a question of, um, if A implies B, then not B implies not A. That's all you can say. So, um, if you start to see backwardations occurring in gold and silver, it says something about the state of inventory of gold and silver. It shouldn't be happening. Or of expected demand. Um, or of expected demand, yes. Um, again, that expected demand would imply that there is some action on the marketplace that is causing that to happen. Now, if that wasn't a function of the inventory, then it would be arbitraged away, straight away. Um, so, yes, expected demand for physical, for physical inventory, for physical gold and silver. So, what, what happened in December last year was, um, in the gold markets, was quite interesting because um, we actually saw December gold moving into a backwardation, December gold as it was back then, um, moving into a backwardation. Now, backwardation in the sense that you could sell spots at a particular bid, you could buy December at the offer, and you could make a roughly 2% annualised profit from doing that. And that continued throughout the whole of December, and it actually um, coincided with a massive run up in the gold price at the same time. Silver was at that point in a permanent backwardation as well, um, and it had been subsequent to that as well, whilst gold had come off of it. Um, so the questions that you have to ask yourself are why is it happening? Is it right? Am I doing my calculations correctly? Um, yes. Um, and what, 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 what does this say? What does this say about the true state of inventory regardless of what you read you know, at the COMEX inventory warehouses or, 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 or what not? So, I'll, I'll give you a brief recitation here because I wrote it out of what happened in, from early December to, uh, to the end of December. So, on the 2nd of December, gold was roughly 775. And the December contract had around 27 days to expiry at that point. And there was around 115 cent backwardation. Um, and the February contract as well, the next successive contract, was showing a backwardation, milder, much milder, but it was showing a backwardation at the same time. So throughout that week, uh, from the 2nd of December, um, there was a constant backwardation, it didn't disappear, it was around 115 cents annualises to around 1.9% or thereabouts. So at the end of that week, gold actually ended lower than 775, um, but the backwardations were still sustained. And um, by Monday the 8th, gold had shot up to 770, and backwardation was still of the same order. And by pit trading on Monday, it reached $780. Tuesday the 9th, the next day, the backwardation increased substantially. We got to 2.5% annualised um, from 1.8% the day before. Wednesday morning, the gold price was up another 
eight dollars or so. And don't forget, in the morning, uh, it's actually quite illiquid trading in the gold market. In the morning, that is in London for me. Um, backwardation was still elevated, 2.8%. Mm -hmm. By Wednesday afternoon, we'd gone from 7.85 to 8.09, up another $25. And Thursday, we saw no contraction in the backwardation at all, and we reached $835. So this was all within the space of a week. We went from 769 to 835. Now, whether that was because of the backwardation or not is a matter of uh, debate. Um, Needless to say, though, that the sharp price was accompanied by it. That's all you can say. Whether it was the cause of it, you know, that will take another, another thesis to show. But they were moving in tandem with one another. You have increases in the, you have increases in the annualized rates of backwardation, and you have excessive movements in the gold price on the upside. So that took us to Friday the 12th, Monday the 15th, the, uh, the backwardation narrowed quite substantially from the week before. We were back down to 1.6%, so from 2.8% or so. Gold was around 8.30 then. Um, by the afternoon on that day, we'd come down to just a 0.6% backwardation, so this is a very, very sharp move to the downside. So, if the theory was correct, this should, for, should have foreseen uh, a sharp fall in the gold price coming. Um, and, you know, lo, lo and behold, you know, it did eventually do that. Um, and, you know, it came off $52 or so from the high by Wednesday uh, of that week. Um, so, you know, what, we, what, what I concluded, what we concluded then, was that, you know, when the backwardation subsided, the bullion price stopped charging ahead, um, and a reversal ensued. Um, and on the contrary, when you have increases in the backwardation, the opposite occurs, you know. It's only one example because it's the only, it's the only time that it's, it's happened in my memory or since I've been watching it. Um, so, so we have... it was an anomaly? It was an anomaly in the sense that, yes, it was the first time that gold had moved into backwardation um, beyond the 1998... Um, uh, central bank agreement limiting the sales of gold. Um, have to ask ourselves again, you know, what were the reasons being given at the time as to as to why why this was happening? Now, many people were saying that zero interest rates, zero percent interest rates, it's a function of that. You know, that zero percent interest rates means zero cost of carry. Therefore, there's going to be no premium for forward versus, as you were saying, spot prices. Um, if you look at every other commodity on planet Earth, obviously not to the same degree of saleability as gold or the, the same degree of perishability, um, they, were, they were not pointing to that at all. You know, copper was in a very heavy contango. All the industrial metals were in very heavy contango. Um, so that argument is not really is not really valid, you know, because it would have applied to those metals just as just as equally. Um, so it seems that we 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 can garner a lot, <coughs> a hell of a lot. Um, about the potential movements in the gold price just by looking at the basis. Um, not, only, not only in gold, but also in, in commodities such as crude oil. And just a very quick point here. Um, a lot of people like to compare oil and gold. 
Um, they couldn't be more different, you know. Marginal utility properties of gold and oil are completely different, you know. Um, but nevertheless, if we turn to the presentation, there's a chart. Um, if we just, I'm sorry, I didn't number. I didn't have time to number the pages. But if you turn to if you turn to that page, um, you'll see on the left-hand side the. Um, um, I just need to see the. The blue line is the, uh, the price of crude oil, near month crude oil. And the little black line beneath it is the ratio of near month to the second month crude oil contract. Now, you can't actually get a spot price per se for oil as you can for gold. So, uh, in order to estimate the, 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 the carry, you have to look at uh, one month versus second month contract. Now you can see all the way up until um, um, October of last year, the, uh, the carry was well under 100. So that means that uh, one, the, the, the second month and the first month were basically trading at more or less the same level. There was no sufficient carry or backwardation. If anything, there was a, a backwardation. Now you can see that. When the, uh, when the carry started to escalate mm. quite aggressively, um, the oil price subsequently collapsed. You know, it, um, it, it, it literally fell out of bed. It had already been falling out of bed, um, and if you actually look um, at the peak of the oil price and compare it with the, uh, the carry at that time, it did reach an intermediate low. So, it's not only gold that basis forecasting can be used for, it can be used for any commodity. Um, and on the right hand side, we've got a much shorter term, this is the current oil price chart up until March of this year. And um, we can see that um, the bottom line is the oil chart there. When you see localised peaks, localized maxima in the, in the carry, it tends to, it tends to um, be a, um, a predis uh, it tends to be a, um, uh, a precursor to the um, oil price moving up. So I've tried to mark those on the charts there as well. Um, so the main point that I just want to leave everyone with at the moment is that you can garner a lot you can garner a lot about the state of the inventory by looking at the ratios of spot and forward markets um, it's, it's, it's adding another dimension that you cannot sort of see in the price of either of the two alone um, the basis, the contango, it gives a measure of the the profitability available to the warehouseman. If I can, if I as a warehouseman can one day make a profit of 2% by buying a particular commodity and selling it forward, and the next day I can make a 3% profit from doing the same thing, that tells me something about the state of the inventory. Um, mainly that there's a lot of it coming there's a lot of inventory coming to the market. If the, it, it's the change in the profitability that is available to the warehouseman that indicates the actual state of the market itself. Doesn't matter whether you're looking at oil or gold or silver or copper, um, the warehouseman doesn't really care what, um, what he um, what he is storing. Um, so, if we just quickly turn to uh, this page. So, there we have an example on the right hand side of um, the gold market and the various carries and the backwardations. That, uh, that, one can, that one can get from 
the spots and the forward markets. Um, median annualised carry, the first line there, 0.4%. Now, that means that with reference to the uh, February contract, as that was, you could make a 0.4% profit annualised by buying gold and selling it forward. Now, again, this is from looking at the gold market from the perspective of buying at the offer <coughs> when it comes to the spot and selling at the bid when it comes to the future. Looking at midpoints doesn't mean anything and there is a, there is a well-known website where, where the proprietor does a talk about the basis but he uses the midpoints of the price's concern and it's completely overlooking the point. You know, you're not actually thinking about the problem properly if you do it that way. So, when we see median annualised decarry, which is about halfway down at minus 2.4%, that is the profit that's available to you for selling spot and buying forward. Mm -hmm. Now, it turns out that at that juncture you couldn't actually make any profit from doing that. In December, <coughs> that was when it was plus 1.6, plus 2.4% um, and whatnot. So, this is the main, um, the main aspect of my, um, of my studies, it's keeping a constant monitor on, um, on these, uh, on these um, data points to look for, to, to look for changes in them. Um, and as we speak, there, 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 there hasn't been anything to suggest that we're going to have a repeat of December at the moment. Um, that could quite easily change. Um, but I just want to sort of run through quickly how I think it's likely to evolve. First of all, talking about contango and backwardation is still quite a um, relatively, re relatively high subject because many people just look at it erroneously. The number of times uh, people at my workplace have said, you know, oil one year out is trading at 80 bucks versus 55 bucks now. You know, it must mean that we're pricing in a very big economic recovery at some point. You know, that just says enough to me for them to for me to realise that they don't know what they're talking about when it comes to the carry. Um, so, when I give my extrapolation as to the way that the market is going to evolve. Gold in backwardation to the people sitting here uh, means a particular thing, but to the majority of other people it means a potential opportunity to make money, risk-free money, by selling their gold inventory, deferring the ownership and buying forward. Now, if one actually undertakes that transaction, you will arbitrage away the backwardation. And that's what we did see in the December contract, the backwardation was arbitraged away. Now whether it was because of people, well it was because of people selling spots because the price had moved sufficiently high for them to, to take that profit and for that to be arbitraged away. So, they're, 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 there, there's not expected to be a problem with you getting your gold back if you undertake that transaction. Um, <laughs> if you look at the <laughs> if you look at the Comex inventory warehouses, you know there, there's plenty of gold there. You know there's no reason why I shouldn't get back my 500 ounces of gold at some point. Um, and so the market is likely to constantly move into a backwardation, sort of like. You know, maybe the dying heartbeats of the market. It will move into backwardation, someone will take it, it will go away, move into not, uh, not a contango, but not a profitable backwardation, let's say. 0.4% is not enough to make me want to carry gold, it's not enough to make me want to carry anything. Um, but what is likely to happen is that 
It will move into backwardation, it will be arbitraged away, move into backwardation again, and constantly this toing and froing until at some point the market will just die. The, pe the very last person that was undertaking that particular arbitrage will eventually not get his gold or silver badge. Now, I don't know how long that will take to evolve. You know, it might take many years, it probably will take many years. It's not something that will likely resolve itself within two or three or four months. So, we're likely to see, sort of, for the next sort of few years, gold and silver constantly moving into backwardation and out of backwardation. Um, and people will expect that, people will just sort of assume that to be a strange anomaly, and there will be all kinds of explanations as to why it's happening. Um, but there will only be one reason why it's happening, the amount of the amount of monetary, the amount of physical gold bears no resemblance to the amount of contracts that are written against it. And pity the poor person who's the last one to try and take the arbitrage by selling their real gold and buying forward. Um, so that, that, that is my opinion as to the way it's likely to evolve. You're not, you're not going to get the gold market moving into a backwardation and then it suddenly ends, you know. There is still sufficient gold in order to undertake these arbitrage transactions, uh, but at some point there won't, at a particular, at that particular price. Um, and heaven help anyone who's actually short physical gold at that juncture. It might not matter if you're short futures and long real gold, but um, if you're short physical gold at that juncture, it will be a very painful, painful period. Um, are there any questions about that? Yep. Uh, two questions, I guess, uh, Sandy. Uh, first one, you said many years. Hmm. Uh, do you have any, uh, any indications from your research that you've seen uh, where you can make any kind of projections as to, for example, how quickly and how deep vaccinations are coming? Uh, are they coming faster? Um, it's, it's, it's only, it's, <coughs> There, hasn't been enough, there haven't been enough observation points to make that yet, you know, because it's, it's, it's only really been in force since last, last December, when there, hasn't been, when there hasn't been a reason for the backwardation like there was in the previous times, as it were, like with the central bank agreement or whatnot. Did anything show up in uh, 2006 uh, when gold and silver in dollar terms both? Uh, 2006, on? I'm not sure. Okay, well, it, it, it could have done. I was... Uh, I wasn't monitoring them back then, but... Um, well, that, that's fine. Yeah. Se second question, then. Um, uh, the professor, uh, when he was talking about the, um, uh, the bond, uh, bond speculators' profits ultimately coming out of yeah. um, productive enterprise, uh, would you say that the profits, I mean, maybe I'm not understanding this correctly, but would you say that the profits that are going to be available over the next number of months or years to the people that are arbitraging this away who is the loser when, when those risk-free profits are taken and are actually realized? Are the losers just the other uh, speculators in the gold market, or uh, is there a deeper sort of an al uh, analog to what the professor uh, was talking about? The well, well, the, the, the loser, the loser in the market will be the last. There, there, there is no loser as such as long as you get your gold back. You know, um, you, sh you have to ask yourself, well, why are the dealers allowing, allowing forward gold to be offered at a discount to spot gold in the first place? Now, they must be doing that because they need to affect some kind of physical gold coming towards them. Now, whether that means that that, that allows them to, to stay solvent because they can meet their liabilities, you know, well, then they're winning, you know, because they, otherwise they'd be insolvent because they couldn't make gold deliveries. Um, but the ultimate loser will be the person who's actually giving up his real gold in order to do that. Um, but again, he will not lose until the very last day when he doesn't get his gold back. Um, is, 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 sort of, is sort of my way of looking at that. Well, yeah. that's, that's very useful. That, that your, your aside at the beginning there actually is exactly what I'm looking for. There yeah. is a loser. It's the, the, the bullion banks. 
Yeah. And they're glad to lose because, as you said, it's simply a cost of doing business and small relative to the paper profits. Yeah. 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 Um, now, I think that's probably it for gold and silver. Um, now, if there are any more questions on on that, I, I hope there are. Question <laughs> comment. Who is one of the number of contracts uh, as well? Because what is interesting is that now the number of contracts not near the same price levels, mid term, weekly, uh, monthly closing two years ago, is only half of that. And we just refer to it, the market could die away over years or months at least um, quietly. And it's, it's, this uh, seems to be happening already. Um, I, don't, I, I monitor total open interest on, on the futures market, but a lot of other people do that, and a lot of other people look at the difference between commercials and non-commercials and blah, blah, blah. To me, all of that is washed out on the basis, you know, so I don't, it's, it's, it's adding a sort of layer of, a layer of... I'm not referring to the network. Right. And yeah. you look at that, you see a significant decline. Even the price is now nearly as high as it was two years ago. Yeah. So it's nearly half of this. And it, 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 it's a fact when you mentioned it, it, it relates a little bit to this thing that a lot of people moving out of this Minex uh, paper. Yes, I mean, you've also had. You've also had the, the ETFs and all kinds of things which, you know, if people were traditionally in gold futures, um, mm. and they didn't want to be, there were other alternatives for them. So that could be a factor in it. It's not something that I, I really look at. I know that um, Tom Sarbo looks at the gold and silver ETF basis versus the spot price. Um, again, I don't think that that's actually looking at the correct thing. You know, it's, 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 it's a bit too, too airy-fairy. Um, but, um, no, I mean, that's m the most likely explanation in my view for that, you know. And for clarification, also you mentioned, if you compare this gold by quotation in December to the other commodities, mm. it looked a little bit abnormal. Yes. It was not in line. Um, do you consider the, the NIMAX movements, um, and I'm not referring now to manipulation in the theories of such things, what is it given is that the most leveraged guy in such a paper game calls the shots at the end of the day. And if you compare all the silver movements, it doesn't look very natural future trading uh, here. How do you see it? Well, um, yes, the most leveraged person does call the shots at the end of the day. Um, you become, you know, that, 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 you become that fit, that, that often used expression, you know, too big to fail, I suppose. But, um, I think the point that I was trying to make about, <laughs> the point that I was trying to make about th those commodities is that, um, you know, if, 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 if you want to, uh, if you want to make, if those people were making those particular arguments for gold and silver as to why they were like that because of interest rates, that same reasoning applies to those, you know, and it doesn't explain why they're in a very high, a very high contango, you know. Um, what is peculiar about gold and silver that they should be, you know, different to those. Um, that was the point that I was trying to make, that's all. You mentioned the end game where you did not want to be short physical. Mm. I remember some time ago Professor McKethe wrote an article talking about there not being a market or price for gold. Mm. Did that somehow tie um, In some ways you see that, yes, yes. I mean, I have to be careful how I phrase that because. Um, you know, um, the professor s said in, the, in one or two of uh, the articles from December that if the price moves sufficiently high, it will compel people to sell spots. Unless that happens, you know, it won't, it won't disappear. So, yes, there is an element of that. There, there, uh, you know, there, there's no price for gold in Zimbabwe and dollars um, is, is the ultimate sort of asymptote, I suppose. Um, but I don't think we're quite there. <laughs> I don't think we're quite there yet. But that is the end game. It will not be for sale 
It will not be available for sale in any fiat currency. But fiat currencies will not die so long as you, know, you have to pay your taxes in them. You know, as soon as you pay your taxes in gold, then there's no need for any, for any currency. Different question. Do you see any relevant parallel from the equity market? Because in the equity market, people trade the basis all the time. Mm. You trade the forward of a single stock versus the spot single stock. Mm. And it moves into backwardation every now and then. Mm. And if you ask an equity derivative trader, you say, well, here's a backwardation in a stock. Mm. What's your guess? Mm. They will say, well, it's a short squeeze. Mm -hmm. People are calling their logs. And we saw this for a recent example in City. Mm. They did some corporate actions, stock loan became very difficult, mm -hmm. and the stock went into extreme backwardation. Mm -hmm. You're talking 10% backwardation on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Two observations on that. If you were a Citicorp or Citigroup analyst, you could then be standing here making the same argument that while well, Citibank went into heavy backwardation, mm -hmm. the stock went up. Mm -hmm. You could then claim that it was causality or that it was a relationship between these two things. Mm -hmm. The second thing, Citicorp is also very widely held. There are millions of people holding Citibank stocks. Why are they not entering the market, selling their physical stock or selling their stocks and buying the future at a 10% per month? That's true. That's true. I mean, I think that um, when it comes to stock futures, people that do own Citicorp stock, this is Citigroup, I think, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, they probably don't know enough about the futures market. I mean, first of all, the futures markets for stocks are, 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 are nothing compared to the actual underlying stocks themselves. You know, they're, they're, significant. they're significant, but not in the same way that, let's say, currency forwards are compared to currencies. You know. Um, also, I think if they did know about it, they would try and affect that transaction. You know, this. But that's my point with the gold market as well. I think yeah. there's loads of holders yeah. that but don't realize this. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That is true. Um, but Citigroup stock is not finite in volume, though. It can be. It can be printed to however. Yes. You know, however much of it is needed. You know, so but that right now. Huh? Not right now. No. <laughs> yeah. no, not right now. Not at well, five you bucks away. Yeah, they can short sell it, which creates stock. Yes, yeah, exactly. It creates much more <coughs> supply and demand of stock than there is actually stock out there, you know. Um, but, um, yeah, the backwardation in, in, in stocks, you know, it's, it's, it's also a function because of the dividend yield as well. You know, you've got exceptionally high dividend yields versus actual cost of funding you know so that means that its natural state will be in a backwardation anyway i don't know what city group's stock is yielding but I'm sure sort of exactly yeah. exactly you know but even sort of companies like let's say unilever which yields five percent you know that's well in excess of Absolutely. you know and you know, <coughs> to your sons it should be in a backwardation now I own Unilever stock personally, but I don't know how to actually affect the transaction of making a risk-free profit by buying the derivative and selling my spot. But I would if I could. <laughs> I would argue that for the average normal person, it's hmm. far easier to do it in a stock than to do it in gold. Because if you have a normal account in yeah. a stock broker, you can go and do a good call reversal in any stock. That's mm -hmm. easy. Whereas the gold futures, normally, I would say that much fewer people have accounts mm -hmm. to trade all futures in relation to the people that have stock accounts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I, I would think it would be easier in gold personally, <laughs> but um, maybe that's just because gold is my hobby. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering if you saw any relevance. Um, there are parallels, but not, not, enough, not enough to make me sort of do extra work on it, unfortunately. <laughs> Any more questions? Right. Well, thanks very much. Thank you. Well, I can only say, JT, Mr. JT, that uh, your presentation has made at least me and perhaps others to start to consider themselves, perhaps in a small way, 
warehouseman. <laughs> and probably so when it comes to silver and gold. And um, I'm sure that uh, uh, we're going to find out more about our roles as this, uh, this uh, crisis continues. Um, we have 20 more minutes on this. Would you like to... Uh, well, I have um, yeah. some questions. Sure. Is in addition to what you have mm. said, I know that you have done some research on the American equity markets. Yes. So that's one thing, if you could Absolutely. Care to say something. Absolutely. Because this is, to my mind, is an extremely interesting Absolutely. line of research which I haven't seen anywhere done. <laughs> and I want our group to benefit. Absolutely. Well, luckily, it's in the, it's in the last, in terms of this slide, marginal utility and marginal prices. Um, now, I think when we uh, when we talk about when we talk about prices, we must remember that we're pricing things in a commodity. We're pricing entities in a medium that has rubbish utility properties. You know, so to say that the price that the Dow Jones is going to be going to 3,000 because, you know, I think the economy is going to do terribly, you know, well, that's a sensible statement to make if the dollar was actually a sensible instrument to price the equity <laughs> in the first place, you know. Um, so what I'm trying to do here is just show in the, in the, in the, in the style of Dr. Von Bomber work as well uh, and Nut Witzel is that everything should be thought of relatively. There is, no, there is no such thing as the price of something. You know, it should always be treated with, with reference to something else. Um, so the main, the, main, the main gist of my, my discussion here is that we all know that the, uh, the, the, the Japanese and um, their neighbours are complicit in purchasing US treasuries to support to support their consumption. And a lot is often made about, you know, they're not going to be sitting on these um, treasuries forever, you know, they, they must realize that they will eventually be worthless. Um, and um, consequently, you know, America will be thrown into a massive, a massive depression through long-term rates going through the roof. Um, if you look at the chart, um, on the, the page after the title of the second part. Um, this is effectively a chart of the yen price of US Treasury debt since 1994. Now, the Japanese, whilst they care about the, uh, the dollar price of debt, they care more about the yen price of debt because that is the currency that they sell it back into. Now, if you look at that chart there, they've done remarkably well, you know, since 1995. You know, they've done remarkably well since 2000. This is a very important point, which explains what practically nobody can explain. Yeah, yeah. You know, so they're, 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 they're sitting there, you know, they're, they're, they're the ones that have been um, capitalizing upon the fact of... Uh, interest rates uh, serially halving and capital values consequently going up. They will have their, uh, I've forgotten the exact Japanese expressions, but it may sound slightly, slightly rude, but they're two-faced. Um, they, they, they want to show with one face anger and discontent, but they're quite happy with the, the, the status quo continuing as it is. Would you say the Chinese are roughly in the same situation? I think they are. I yeah. think they are. Yeah. You I see, think this are. is also very important yeah. because nobody understands why they hang on. Why yeah. don't they dump? Exactly. Exactly. You know, so, so why, why don't they dump? You know, it's a question that, you know, we, we all ask ourselves. Now, these are just all rough, rough estimates here, but um, foreigners own roughly 30% of uh, US government paper in one form or another. Um, now, who, who are the countries that matter in that region? Well, it's China, Japan, and India. Now, 
all three of those countries are, in one way or another, complicit in maintaining a weak currency in order to support American consumption. Um, you know, the Chinese have it more or less pegged. Uh, Japanese, obviously, complicit in currency manipulation. And the Indians, you know, well, they're not unknown to be doing that kind of thing as well, except they just don't make it public. Um, you know, when we consider, you know, they know where the ultimate, the ultimate form of capital preservation lies. And it's not going to be in holding long-term government paper forever. Um, you have to consider, well, how much of the US equity market do they own? Uh, when I say they, I mean anyone that's not an American citizen. And it's only roughly 10%. So 10% of US equity capital markets are owned by um, uh, foreigners. You can coin it. So you have to say to yourself, well, what is the likelihood of that 30% uh, versus 10% staying in those ratios? I don't think it's very likely at all. You know, you have to say to yourself, well, what's going, what, 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 what's likely, what's likely going to happen? Um, we have to remember that treasuries are not infinite, uh, uh, infinite maturity uh, securities. They do expire, and if you look or try to guesstimate the um, the weighted average sort of maturity profile of Asian treasury holdings, you'll probably find that it's more or less one or two years away from now. The, 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 the bulk of expiry is coming up. Now, that makes a big difference in terms of credit versus money because suddenly credit is turning into real money because it's maturing. Now, Questions about where are they going to get the money from, blah, 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 is irrelevant. They'll just print the money, you know. But the point is, is how is it going to be redeployed? Now, if at the margin it's not redeployed to the same extent that it was um, in the first place in treasuries, then that, that trickle, that, that little bit that isn't redeployed <coughs> has to find a home somewhere else. And the most likely place for that to find a home is, is in the equity market. So it is with that in mind that you have to say to yourself, well, when have massive peaks in the yen price of US Treasury debt, have they coincided with troughs in the yen price of US equities? Or more importantly for the Americans, the dollar price of US equities? So if you turn the page, you'll see the US dollar price of equities there in tandem with the uh, yen price of US Treasury debt. Now there are big, uh, there are four horizontal lines marked there. Now the four horizontal lines mark the peaks in the yen price of US Treasury debt. And without exception, it has been the precursor to a huge US dollar price rally of equity markets. Forget about the yen price of US equity markets, which are obviously going through the roof as the yen is weakening anyway. So it's that, it is that potential in the system, you know, that, 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 that gives me confidence that um, whilst we all know the real economy is going to hell in a handbasket, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. Um, there is a flaw to the nominal price of assets and in particular equities themselves because of this mere um, churning of capital, as it were. Um, so, we have to be very careful of people who, who, constantly, um, who constantly expect the Dow Jones to be going you know, to 1,000 you know, within a year or something like that. I've heard, sort of, I've heard many people say similar order numbers for that. Because capital preservation 
um, lies last by holding treasuries and equities are still slightly superior um, when it comes to capital preservation than treasury holdings themselves. And more importantly, it's been borne out in history. You can see it for yourself there. So, very recently, um, we reached an extreme in the um, US pr uh, yen price of US debt um, at the beginning of 2009. I think on the chart there you can see. Um, and lo and behold, we've started to see the US equity markets rally sort of quite substantially from their, uh, from their lows as of the past couple of weeks. Now, many questions are sort of still being asked. Is it, is it, is it, is it sustainable? Is it, you know, it is sustainable. It's very sustainable because there's, there's an amount of capital that will be coming, you know, um, at the margin to, 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 uh, to, to establish prices where there is effectively no one willing to sell. All the people that wanted to sell equities have already done it. And the way that, you know, I'd like to just very quickly bring the analogy to that is if you have ten houses, identical houses, in a street, and uh, one of them is for sale at, let's say, ten million pounds, and another is for sale at nine million pounds, and the others are for sale at five hundred and six hundred and seven hundred thousand pounds, well, obviously, those will clear before the houses that are on offer at nine or ten million pounds. Those houses will clear, those offers will be taken, and the only offers that will be left are the ones from the people who hardly drop their offers in the first place. So the one who has his house still on at 9 million, and the other one who has his house on at 10 million. Now, if someone actually wants to affect a transaction, that's the price they'll have to pay. That's the reason the Dow Jones is up a thousand points in a week. It's not because of some massive recovery, it's because the only people that were left offering stock were the ones who hardly dropped the offer in the first place. Now, what's likely to happen is that even those people are likely to withdraw their offers as they realise that they're the only people offering stock. And it's likely to escalate even higher. So, we have to dissociate between asset prices and the real economy because they're like chalk and cheese. And um, the essential conclusion is that you should be buying, and I know this might sound like a uh, horrific thing to say, but you should be aggressively buying US equities for a three to five year period. And um, I, I, I said, you know, you should, you should probably have your, 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 the bulk of your positioning done by April. Well, we're, we're virtually there now. Um, frankly, because I want to beat my friends in the East before they start bidding ahead of me. Um, it's just something not to look, it's, it's something not to, um, to, to consider likely um, because they will be bidding, they will be bidding at some point and if you're not bidding ahead of them you will not be able to afford the prices that they'll be willing to bid <coughs> to get out of treasury paper at some point. Um. I could agree with you, though the world was have to be very careful telling us that the Dutch was supposed to break the thousand or one thousand. Um, somewhere in between it will happen. But um, much more important, what impact will the tectonic shift, the sea change have, which happened this year in financing all this debt? Because this year there is a true game change in all of that. Sorry, what, 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 what? Well, what I'm referring to is. This scenario played out clearly as you excellently analyzed as wrong as there had to be uh, money recycled because mm -hmm. of trade surpluses mm -hmm. from the east to the west. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is, has stopped now. Japan is now for three, four months over in deficit, and yeah, it, it sounds big, two trillion of dollars mm -hmm. in China, mm -hmm. but one trillion here, one trillion there, like in these days, it's gone. And one trillion they invest uh, themselves. Mm -hmm. The trade surpluses are gone. Yeah. They are gone now because of the collapse of the economy. So I see a scenario possible, very much possible, that this year there is not much of recycling anymore coming out of the east into the west. And then the, 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 the game changes. 
Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, the point about it is that regardless of what's happening at the margin in terms of trade flow, they still have a huge inventory of treasuries. Now, that inventory... Yeah, but this treasury only that is why I think especially the Chinese are vocal, because the Japanese stopped, uh, uh, did not stop, sorry, I'm but declined the mm. final treasury since five years now. Mm -hmm. you don't tell, but when you look at the buying treasuries from the Japanese, the uh, US, it's significant decline over a five years period. That is why China is now the biggest holder of this treasury. Mm -hmm. And now they have these treasuries, but now this, as you said, printing the money. They just have to print the money for sure and ship it over when there is a maturity coming, mm -hmm. coming soon. Mm -hmm. But that will not have the same effect as in the past, I guess. What could it be? What will it be? No change at all if America really brings the money now out of the air? As in the till last year or in the recent months, where trade surpluses really they are worked for and earned had to be recycled. This is what I'm, what I'm wondering if that might have an effect. Um, well, it's, it's, it, it's, it's hard to say. Um, the way that I look at it is that, um, you know, um, regardless of of what actually they do with the maturing, the maturing debt, deposits will be created in the financial system as a consequence of it. Now, um, what is done with those deposits? You know, we can all we can all question. You know, we can all have a discussion about what will be done with those deposits. Um, I'm just referring to what they are already doing now. What they have announced is at least 600, 587 or whatsoever billion infrastructure. Yeah. So it still sounds 2 trillion close to it uh, of all US paper China's holding. Yeah. But one third is already allocated. Yeah. You know. yeah. So we get this 700 billion, but it's already spent. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if of this, even looking big size uh, yeah. coffers, might be I mean, I don't know the exact mechanics, you know, if, if China says that they're going to say 700 billion, you know, to what extent does that mean that they need to have dollars in the bank account for every yuan that they're printing in the economy? It's, that's not something that's clear to me, per se. So just to say that they're going to be, they're, 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 they're uh, they're, they're keeping aside, let's say, one third of the treasury holdings to be spent locally. Well, that could just mean in dollar terms, but it could all be yuan funded, you know. So. Um, yeah, sure, but still, that, that is a difference which I'm referring to. Yeah. They can bring it themselves, but then they will have inflationary pressures on the yuan, which will be difficult at least yeah. Uh, yeah. to control. Or, as yeah. should be the normal way or much more logical way, and they're quite uh, smart, I think. They take the dollars mm. Mm. and spend it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Know, your scenario is that huge volumes of that we go back into equities. I'm with you for sure that there will be some effect, but how big it is, uh, especially with this year it starts. Last mm -hmm. week, the UK, first time since many, many years, had the first uh, failed guilt auction, which never happened before. Uh, the, the auctions in America are always safe but indirect it's, uh, since, since weeks and months. So it is a little bit. Uh, they, it, did, it did fail, but it actually uh, <laughs> it, it closed up 50 basis points um, sort of at, at the end of the auction. So the papers didn't actually mention that part of it. But, yeah, um, it you know. Last minute comes in directly. Yeah. 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 Where it comes from. Yeah. Caribbean. From the Bank of England. <laughs> Now, it's, the serious issue is just, I'm not so sure if that much paper, it's all a paper game, is still left one year from now or two years from now. Yeah, I think also another thing that, you know, we have to uh, just remember is that when you create, when you're transferring X trillion from treasury into deposits, the multiplier effect on deposits is a hundred times bigger than on the same amount of treasuries, you know. Yeah, so, maybe. you know... But when it shows, it doesn't happen anymore. Well, no, 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 but the point that I'm trying to make is that $700 billion, let's say, um, could quite easily be multiplied by 15 or 20 times when it comes to dictating asset prices, you know, as long as the uh, institutions which are being 
as long as leverage holds. As long as leverage holds, as long as solvency holds. Now we are in a period which I would really ask uh, in the dispute, we are now in a deleveraging period. We are in a deleveraging period, but... I agree with you under the normal circumstances from leverage. Was the name of the game. And we are and continuously I see even deleveraging the name of the game, which has simply the reverse effect. We are we are in deleveraging, but okay, the multiplier effect is still there. Now it is obviously quite bashed up at the moment. Um, the multiplier effect falling um, is a is, is is something to think about, but the multiplier effect is still there. If it goes to 15, from 15 times to 10 times, so what? You know, that is not deleveraging to me. It's it's disenleveraging or something. You know, it's it's not deleveraging. Yeah, but where do you where do you get the point that the multiplier is still functioning? I don't see it. Ah, practice. well, no, it's it's not functioning at the moment. But the point is to discount that into perpetuity is erroneous, though. You know. That, that, that is erroneous, to discount that into perpetuity. Um, as long as, and I think the failure of Lehman's made everyone realise this, as long as the solvency of all institutions are maintained, um, multiplier effects will not concave. They won't, they won't, they won't, they won't uh, collapse. You know? So um, I think the government's realised that, that solvency is the key. It's not liquidity. There's plenty of liquidity. Um, Consequently, if you think the multiplier is two at the moment, equities are probably discounting one. You know, they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not discounting a much higher multiple. You know, so um, you just have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> you have to wait. <laughs> have to wait. Uh, I would like to ask you, Sandy, to say a few words about this pilot project yes. which you are involved because you see we have been emphasizing the basis and in silver and gold as a tool to invest or if you like mm -hmm. to warehouse gold yes. and silver for saving our civilization for future generations. So in practice it's actually happening now and Sandeep is involved in such a pilot project and I know you can't reveal all the details but at least a few absolutely, words for absolutely, the benefit of Absolutely. Um, I think very briefly, um, you know, when, when, uh, when we consider how asset prices are actually achieved, you have to take into account that if you only have to deposit 5% in order to buy something, then it's going to have a roundabout effect on the natural level of its price. Um, if it came to, let's say, one wanting to own a particular asset over 25 years, do you want to own property or gold? Most people would say, well, I'd rather own property, because you can rent out property, you can derive an income from it at the same time. If I showed you a chart of US median house prices divided by the gold price, um, you'd certainly see that you'd rather have your money in gold over the next 25 years than in US property. Now, don't confuse that by looking at the nominal US house price in dollar terms. You must look at it relative to gold. The only problem with gold is that you cannot make it generate, uh, well, traditionally people think that you cannot make it generate an income for you. Now, what we are doing at, uh, at my firm is effectively using the basis to uh, dictate, um, um, dictate the, um, the kind of option structures that we are writing on the back of our gold holding. So it's effectively a form of covered writing um, where the extent of where we are writing, what levels we are writing at, is dictated by the movements and the basis and solely on the movements of the basis, because that is complete as far as the understanding of the market is concerned. So with this offering, you know, we, we hope to be, you know, we hope to be able to, to say to people, you know, don't, don't buy um, a treasury bond. You know, you might think you're getting 5% for free. Sorry, you might think you're getting 5% risk-free 
on a 30-year bond. But by the time you get your principal back in 30 years' time, I'm pretty sure that $100 will buy you a cup of coffee at the very most, you know. Um, so the question is, how can you do that with gold? And this is the intention of, of, of the fund, is to be able to say to people, you have the opportunity again to save in gold and earn in gold. Um, and um, strictly, sorry, not earning in gold, you'll be earning in dollars, but uh, at the moment you can still use those dollars to buy gold. Um, whether that's still the case, you know, we'll have to see. Um, so the, 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 the initial results, I've been running it for about seven or eight months now. So we all know what the gold price has done over seven or eight months. We've given an extra 15% on top of that from the call writing and the put writing. And it's a sustained process, you know, it's, it's not a, I'm not a trader, it's a sort of, it's a cumulative process whereby you cumulatively build the cash element of the, uh, of the book. And the intention is to pay it out semi-annually or annually as a dividend um, so that you can actually keep vast quantities of gold um, like Midas and actually earn an income from it at the same time, which I'm sure our friends in China are doing anyway, you know, at the moment. Uh, it's just that they don't tell you about it. Um, and very, very quickly as well, um, I'm sure a lot of the people around, uh, around here must read Ted Butler. Um, and I used to read him when I was very naive as well. And um, the main point about it is that um, there are no naked shorts in the gold and silver market. If there's any market which someone would be naked short in, it would not be that market, you know. And for him to sort of quite blatantly assume that there are well, dinosaurs and raptors and things like this, that and the other, just sort of, you know, naked shorting and just waiting for everybody to, 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 to go the other way. It's just wrong. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a visual side to it, which is that short position, and there's the hidden side of it, which, you know, I know, I know the professor has tried to, to, to speak to Mr. Butler about this, but he hasn't, uh, he hasn't even bothered to, uh, to reply. Um, so, this is going to be our way of offering what the Chinese, the Indians, I'm sure as well, have been doing for many, many, many decades, um, and make it available to everyone, as it should be. Thank you very much. Thank you.